Welcome, everyone. Hi, it's Henry DeVries, CEO of Indie Books International and business development columnist for Forbes.com. So glad you're here on the Marketing with a Book podcast. And remember, it's not marketing a book, it's marketing with a book. It's about how do independent consultants, coaches, experts attract high paying clients by marketing with a book and a speech. Very special guest today, can't wait to get to him. But first we like to do our author roundup. So we like to have our authors introduce themselves. It helps our speaker to know who's on the line and it helps other aspiring authors to know that they're not in this alone. There are other people who are fighting the fine fight, trying to get their message out there for more credibility, more impact and more influence. So I'd like to turn that over. We'll go around the horn. You can unmute yourself. Uh, let's start with uh, Allison Tabor and then David Goldman. Uh, hi there, Henry and everyone. Allison Tabor, author of the Work Your Assets Off, Stop Working So Hard and Business End in Life, uh, which was a number two bestseller on Amazon, thanks to the advice that uh, Henry shared. If only I had planned on being a number one versus I said, I just want to be a bestselling author, Henry. So I should have said, I just want to be a number one bestselling author. Interesting distinction. Anyway, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to Michael's share today. David, before I bring you on, I got to tell Allison, um, when my wife was first married to me, I, she'd never had a new car. And I said, what do you want? And she goes, I, I want it to be new. I've never had a new car. And I want it to be automatic transmission. And I want an AM FM radio. And that arrived in the driveway. And she said, where's the air conditioning? I said, you didn't ask for air conditioning. <laughs> Be yes. careful of what you ask for. And what you leave out, no doubt. What you leave out. Yeah, it's like that old monkey's paw thing where you find the monkey's paw, it'll grant your wish. But, uh, you know, it's like the genie in the bottle. You got to be careful what wish you ask for. Okay, Allison, it's so good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. David Goldman, you're up. Thanks, Henry. That was good advice, too. I'll be careful what I ask for. Hi, I'm David Goldman, and uh, I'm usually from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, originally at least, and I'm, I spent the winter in Florida. Currently, I'm in Walnut Creek, California. I'm going back to Florida. I know, crazy. Anyway, I uh, wrote the book, The Road to Happiness, How to Get What You Really Want, and I'm most excited about a book that I'm writing and almost finished with, soon to be published with Henry and with Mark LeBlanc called Bringing in the Business. David, good to see you. And uh, I believe it's 40 degrees and wet in Pittsburgh today because right. it's April 19th. So exactly. yeah, that's the weather you're getting there. So Walnut exactly. Creek and Florida, good places to be. Not, no question. Okay. Um, Let's bring up Mason and then Dr. Carey. Well, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on with my fellow uh, authors and family members from Indie Books on this uh, Marketing with a Book podcast. My name is Mason Harris. My book is The Chutzpah Advantage. And as we talk about asking for the things that we want, that's a fundamental characteristic of chutzpah. There you go. Thank you, Mason. So good to see you. Dr. Carey, tell me how to be happy. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Carey coming from Denver, Colorado. And Henry, part of what's going to make you really happy is we're getting so much closer to our book launch for self-help on the go. So Yay. we are close. It is exciting. And I am going to be thrilled to show everybody the book. So. What I'm excited is some people do noble work out there helping broken people, and that's important work. Um, I love that your work is helping people who are good get even better. Uh, yes. Good to great, if we could steal the line from Jim Collins, and that there are uh, strategies, tactics, life hacks, if you will, and you share those with your clients and you share those with the readers in this book. So very excited to publish your book. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I can't wait. Okay. Um, and now um, uh, Steve, Steve uh, Swaverly, and then we'll go with uh, Stephen Brody. 
back to back Steve's. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for asking me to uh, join the meeting today, Henry. I'm Steve Swavely. I'm in Hendersonville, North Carolina, and the working title of my book is Optimal Team Performance. Okay, Optimal Team Performance. People want that, Steve. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm enjoying uh, editing this book with you. Uh, really looking forward to bringing this out. And I'm really glad you're here today for Michael. I think uh, what Michael teaches uh, is so important for your work. I think Dr. Carey will pick up things uh, today that'll help her in her work. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you. And, and then uh, Mr. Brody from Houston. Hey, thank you. It's Steve Brody from Houston, Texas. Good, uh, good to see you, Michael. It's it's been a few years since. Likewise, I, Steve. At some of my older prior groups when I was with Vistage, uh, the book I published several years ago is called "What Happens After the Sale." Uh, it's been a fun journey with what the private owners and companies do once they decide to exit and go to the next step in life. Steve, you do a very noble work. That's a noble work to help a business owner. And I know after, I, I still recall a conversation we had in Houston after dinner about Indie Books International. And I'll just do the gist of it. If I cared enough about my people, I would work hard to make this a mature business that could operate without me if it had to choose to do that. Um, right. And I've been working hard on it. I'm working real hard, Steve. You're working hard. Um, That's good. That's good. Thank Great. you. Um, let's see. We have uh, Rick with us today. Rick, uh, introduce yourself, please. You're on mute right now, Rick. But if you wanted to pass, that's a right answer. I got it. How's okay. that sound? I'm Rick Tokini, uh, Austin, Texas, uh, author of seven life lesson books and when core values are strategic which was published by financial times press and uh we run here in austin success made to last productions we've we've done over 3200 podcasts and we have an author's corner which promotes authors and then we have a a, a division down in san antonio called game day media that records and formats and edits for audible so um, we're enjoying a great um, upswing in our industry, and I'm glad to be here today. Thanks for, thanks for visiting us. You do a noble work, too. Um, there's a lot of experts who can help people. They just need help getting that message out there. So thank you for what you do, and thanks for joining us today. Um, you bet. Let me see did it, if I missed anybody. Um, I don't think I missed anybody. Hi, I'm Henry DeVries. I'm an author here too. Uh, my 14th book, Rainmaker Confidential. So it was the result of a year long research study on how top professionals were making their business development investments. And we like to say their time, treasure and talent. Those are the, those are the three investments. There's also the three wagers you make every month. How are you wagering your, your time, your talent, and your money, your treasure. And that's what the book's about. So just a, a ground rule, I'm a baseball fan. If you, if you don't know me already, you'd learn that pretty quick. Um, I was at my first game of the season last night uh, with San Diego Padres, and I'll be going to a couple of dozen baseball games around the country this year. I, I just love baseball. So at the start of a baseball game, the managers come out and the umpires come out and they go over the ground rules. So if we're in Wrigley Field in Chicago, if the ball bounces into the ivy and gets stuck in the ivy, what happens? What does that mean? Ground rule double. So our ground rules today, there are several. One is this is meant to be interactive in a little slightly different way in that you can ask any question you want in the chat. So ask it in the chat if you have questions for our guest, Michael Olasso, today. And then I'll be reviewing that and working it into the interview. So please do that. Um, 
The other thing is, in addition to the call for questions, um, I want to thank our sponsors. So our partners at Indie Books are uh, Claim the Stage Workshops, PRPR Public Relations, uh, no, no, excuse me, Prather Speaker Marketing Services. Oh, here's a tip. Get your sponsor's name right. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a little tip there. You can take that away. Uh, sorry, Nona and Brandon. Pray their market, uh, speaker marketing services. I got to practice that. So um, uh, those are just some of our sponsors, and we want to thank them. Okay, and now I'd like to bring on our special guest, Michael Alasso. And if you could pin us side by side, Suzanne, producer Suzanne, that'd be great. So what do Tom Brady and Michael Alasso have in common? The answer, they're both goats, meaning the greatest of all time in their profession. Uh, Tom Brady, of, uh, formerly of Michael's beloved New England Patriots, and uh, now retired, unretired with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, is the greatest of all time as a NFL quarterback. There's just no question about it when you look at his record and accomplishments. Well, Michael is the greatest of all time when it comes to Vistage speakers. And Vistage, if you don't know it, is the world's number one CEO peer-to-peer -peer organization. Um, last I checked, they were upwards of more than 23,000 CEOs. Uh, Steve Brody, a former chair, is with us today. Um, Michael's distinct distinction is, um, first off, Michael, help me out. I think you're close to 1,800 Vistage presentations. I just finished my, um, <laughs> my 1,998th this oh. afternoon. Well, okay, two more to go and it'll be 2000. That'll be easier for me to remember. Um, and uh, he won Vistage Speaker of the Year so many times they had to rename the award. Uh, so, so it just didn't become like, you know, uh, in baseball, the uh, batting crown is now the Rod Carew Award. So I think we should make that Vistage Speaker of the Year the Michael Alasso Award. But um, that's just my opinion. Um, so of the curated speakers, that's what they say. You don't just get to speak to Vistage. You have to prove yourself. Uh, you're tested. You're measured all the time. Uh, Michael's scores are second to none. Uh, on a scale of one to five, we're looking at a six. He's like advanced placement. You know, it's higher than the normal GPA. Um, he comes from the world of theater. I'm supposed to say theater. He comes from the theater uh, where he was an actor and a director. And somehow the business world discovered him and what he brought to the table in helping them with presentations. Uh, I was honored to uh, travel with Michael to several Vistage groups in the country and hear him present his signature talk, You on Your Best Day. And it was a master class every time about how to present, not just techniques, but how to handle hecklers, how to handle a uh, pushback, um, how to nurture an audience so you earn the right to give them the hard news they need to hear. Uh, I hope he'll be sharing some of that and those techniques. Um, Michael is very accessible on YouTube. Many presentations you can see with him and his work. Um, I suggest you do that as R&D. Robin duplicate, best ideas from Michael <laughs> Alonso. Steal from the best. My mom used to say to me, and she was a waitress from New York. She goes, Henry, if you're gonna steal, steal a million dollars. I shared that with my high school counselor. My mother got called down to the school, and but they didn't they didn't speak New York. You know that just meant don't steal, because if you're going to trade if you're going to trade your integrity and your ethics, it better be big. It better be worth it. 
Um, but in uh, so I do that in jest, but um, Michael wants you to be better. He wants you to have your best day. And he has 35 secrets about that. He has some special gifts. His brand is generosity. He's very generous. And I appreciate your generosity today, Michael. Um, tee it up. What are you going to share with us today? Come and give a listen. Come and take a look. We're here all to help you by marketing with the book. <laughs> Hello there, listeners. Learn to present with ease by hanging around with Mr. Henry DeVries. <laughs> hey, Namaste. Henry. Thank you. <laughs> nice awesome. little great intro, brother. Now that I was... have theme music, Suzanne. <laughs> Henry, I had forgotten how good you are at stand-up. You're doing stand-up the whole time. What's interesting, Henry, is that you know, uh, when I, I got locked down, New Englanders, we, we took it seriously, everybody. We were seriously locked down. Thank you, Dr. Carey. It's sweet of you. Yeah, we, so I was locked down for 59 weeks, 59 straight weeks, and no church, no gym, um, no restaurants. I mean, even outdoor restaurants were a no-no uh, for my wife. Nope, we did nothing. And so... I, I felt sorry for myself for the first five minutes. And then I said, idiot, you're a, a film director. You're an actor. This should be the perfect storm of all your gifts. And so I pivoted and I turned you on your best day to you and your best Zoom day. And so in those 59 weeks, I did 299 workshops and keynotes. Now, the one-on-ones are completely separate from this, which were as many, but in a 59 week period, I had never done that many workshops and keynotes, but it was easy, right? You, you do the UK at five in the morning, you do New York at nine, Minnesota at noon, LA at three, Australia at 8.30 at night. I mean, you just could keep working the whole time right there. And the, the first group I did, so my lockdown began, began March 13th, 2020, completely locked down. By Monday, I was doing my first Zoom group. I didn't even know what Zoom was. It was kind of easy because I was supposed to go to Birmingham that week with a client. And the CEO is a buddy of mine. So we talked and he said, hey, let's try this Zoom thing. And I already had a relationship with his people. So I did his executive team. We were klutzes, um, but we had a good time and it worked. The first time I had to do it for a group I never spoke to before was that Thursday for a Vistage group in Philadelphia. And you know how those people are. And so we're all getting on the screen. First person to unmute, CEO, she unmutes. She leans toward the camera and she says, I hope this isn't gonna be about coronavirus the whole time. And then she muted. What was she saying to me? Roller skate monkey, dance for me, white boy. Yeah, perform. And so, Henry, what I'm so taken by your intro today is you get it. In this virtual, this hybrid world that we're going to live in, that people say, when we get back to normal, we're never getting back to normal. It's a, if you can't adapt to this world, you are going to lose. And so what we're learning is that being funny is critical. And you get it, Henry. I mean, like the whole, even your comments to people were funny. Here's a tip. Get your sponsors straight. I mean, you know, it's like every, like you're doing stand up, brother. And that's what keeps an audience present. So they listen to the, to the important pieces. Bravo to you. Thank you, Michael. And by the way, Philadelphia is the first city to boo an Easter egg hunt. I remember. And they have a prison in their stadium. <laughs> they boo Santa Claus. Why? Because they need it. I was just there last week and i love philly that's a horrible thing is i do love philly yeah america <laughs> sure they have cheesesteaks but you know <laughs> what else what else do they got the liberty bell they got cheesesteaks yeah okay <laughs> but it's the phillies and the eagles indeed okay, um, so so i gotta i gotta be the ringmaster keeping this circus on on track here 
So what's your best advice for our authors and speakers? You were so great to come out and see us just before the lockdown. Uh, so now what's your best advice for our authors and speakers? Are you talking about presenting virtually, presenting in person? Yes, Both. and. Yeah. Yes, and. We do a lot so, of improv here. Yes, and. You got it, brother. So any problems that you have in person only get magnified exponentially on, on the camera. So if your body language, for example, is not dynamic on the camera, that gets exacerbated. If your eye contact is not good in person on the camera, that gets exacerbated. If your energy is low in person on the camera, that gets exacerbated. So it's interesting, Henry, uh, when I do these groups, Vistage and otherwise for private companies, often the CEO of the Vistage chair before I speak will go around the room and they'll say, uh, hey, tell Michael how you're feeling today in one adjective. Do you know what the overwhelming answer has been over the last year, year and a half? What? Exhausted, tired, fed up, frustrated. People are tired of this. They're tired of communicating virtually. They're tired of having a meeting where it's a hybrid and I spend 40 minutes setting up the owl for the two people at home. Tired of the mass, tired of the discussion about mass, tired of the vaccination discussion. They're tired of everything. And so what, what you learn the most is that our job is if we're gonna lead the group, if we're gonna to speak to the group, is we've gotta have energy, that people are tired. And so how you start, how you come out of the gate could determine everything. If you don't come out of the gate with class, you lose. And that's why Dr. Carey, I was so pleased to see you write what you wrote in the chat. Yeah, people wanna start conservatively. You can't anymore. I'm not sure you ever could, but now more than ever, what is that hot opening? What is that hot opening that grabs the audience? You've got to be out of the gate. And remember, uh, the prologue is also important. And so what's the prologue? The thing before the thing. Maria Callas, the great opera singer, says the opera begins for the opera singer long before the curtain goes up and ends long after it goes down. And what, what we sometimes think is that our presentation begins when we're introduced and ends when it's over. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You are alive before and after and people are evaluating you the whole time. We call that skill in theater, everybody, immersion. So actors don't pretend to be the role. What do they do? They are the role. So I'm not interested in you being the author on Thursdays and Fridays from three to five, only on mornings after you've had your coffee. You are this person. You are living this person. And you know, it was exciting, Henry, to hear all those titles. What happens after the sales, Steve? I love that, because that's the epilogue. What's going on afterwards? The road to happiness, David. You know, the, this isn't about, uh, if you don't blend act one and act two, you lose. So Henry, what, what I've been noticing more than ever is the act one, act two blend. So act one is this, everybody, my business life. Act two's waiting for me in the coast of Maine. And I don't know about you, but any play I've ever seen or directed, act two's more important than act one. So the same amount of energy that I give to you in this moment, I have to give Peggy. And when I'm home in the virtual world, that's harder. Because think about it today, I'm in a hotel room in Cincinnati. So I finish with you. I might run and get some Grater's ice cream. Um, and then when I'm good and ready, I call Peggy, check in. If I were at home now, I would turn off the computer and there she is, no intermissions. So what we're learning in this world is that we have to be immersed in the moment and then have those intermissions. So, you know, uh, Mason, when you're talking about your keynotes, how are you opening and how are you closing? What does that look like? And so the one thing, Mason, if you're, are you doing them live or virtually? Because Mason, one thing we noticed, if you looked at Mason, he's got a set design. So when, when Henry taught, when Henry, when you talk to all these folks, it, what we're forgetting in the virtual world is that you have to be a set designer, sound designer, lighting designer, costume designer. We didn't have to do that live so much. 
now and so mason what I, I don't know if you're doing them virtually i love your sense of design the way you like because people want to whine and say oh you can't connect with people virtually stop whining you know it's like look look at henry's set i mean that forbes magazine and look at how beautifully it's choreographed the mug you know and how henry's slightly off center it's artistic you got to make choices you got to make choices so so now in person someone else is doing that but your costume have you thought about what you're wearing so more than ever we have to be intentional in our micro messaging so folks for me the most important word is authenticity if i don't believe you're real i'm not going to pay attention and what i think some people forget is in order to be 100 authentic you have to be 100 intentional and what I think sometimes people measure authenticity on is obstacles. My back hurts, I'm tired. I've done two workshops already today and I did a one-on-one -on -one before this podcast. So I'm tired, so I'll be authentic and cranky and tired. Mm, no, you don't measure authenticity from your obstacles. You measure authenticity from your objectives. And so Henry, your intro was so comprehensive my objective is I want everybody on this podcast to walk away with a minimum of two ways to upgrade the way they're going to communicate, the way they're going to speak, the way they're going to present. That's the authentic event. So all my choices have to support that authentic event. My sore back, that I hate that I'm in a hotel room, that I don't have my pretty usual set in my studio, the fact that I've done two four-hour workshops already and a one-on-one, -on -one, and I have to run and do a business dinner right at all that. All that are obstacles. That's not how you measure authenticity. You measure authenticity through your objective. So Mason, you go back to your keynote, right after that hot opening, state your objective. I believe, I believe we need to state our objectives out loud. Tell people what we want. By the end of this meeting, if we're successful, you will walk out of here and what will you do? I even state my objective out loud when I'm having lunch with my son. Can you imagine how awful it must be being my son, constantly getting feedback for James? So when we go out to lunch, I say to James, my objective today is that we're going to bond as father and son. Oh, he breathes a big sigh of relief. He takes off his tuxedo. He belches. He farts. That's, state your objective out loud. Henry, did I misunderstand your question? You're, you're, you're doing great. You're doing great. So I just want to take a time out and, and we're going to talk a little inside baseball, but inside presentations. Michael is demonstrating everything he wants you to do. He's specifically demonstrating many things. So because uh, I, uh, I have seen it, I have debriefed it, uh, I've written about it, I can see. So one of the things is the specific feedback. And that's one of your main messages is about specific feedback. Would you share your technique on that, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Henry, for asking. Because of the 35 secret weapons, it's the only thing I've copyrighted in the 35 secret weapons or trademarked, whatever the correct phrase is. Well, it's, you know, it was great the way you did the opening. Uh, Allison, like right away, I loved you, Allison, because what did Allison say? I'm looking forward to Michael's presentation. And of all those little vignettes you did, Allison and Steve are the only ones who mentioned my name. How do you think that makes me feel? Do you know, remember I told you tired was the number one thing that people said at the beginning? Henry, as I'm leaving, sometimes the leader of the group will say, hey, before Michael runs off to catch his plane, give him some feedback. In the last year, do you know what the number one overwhelming feedback has been? I felt seen and heard today. Now, at the beginning, everybody, I thought, really? That's the best. That's all I do is I see and hear. And then I thought about it. Think about what that means. In general, people don't feel seen and heard. So what can be your special sauce, given these great books that you're writing, just all about making people better? is how can we see and hear people better? And so Allison and Steve, by saying my name, I feel seen and heard, that I actually feel like somebody special. 
you know, and it's, we already talked about Mason's beautiful set. You know, David, one thing, a great thing David did was that after Allison spoke, Henry gave his two cents, uh, you know, about you didn't ask for the air conditioning. He gave the great story about his wife. So what was David's first sentence? That was good advice. I'll be aware of what I asked for. See, that may seem like a little thing, but it's a big thing. Because what David did was he told Henry, I heard you. He told Allison, I heard you. I wasn't just worried about my turn to promote my book. I was listening. That, that to me is a big deal. Um, Dr. Carey being the first one to put a, a, a flash, a, a text up on the chat that was positive. Like you gave me positive, you modeled what Henry's talking about. So Dr. Carey right away, immediately put up in the chat, whoa, Michael, this is really good. I'm gonna use this um, for the beginning. Uh, this is a strong takeaway, a hot beginning. How do you think that makes me feel when I live to make people feel valued to give? What Henry said is not a lie, I live to be generous. That's what my lifeline is. Um, you know, it's, you see so many excellent things. Our job is to comment on them. So folks, what truthful, specific, positive feedback is, is feedback. So time out. Feedback's a compound word. What's the first word in feedback? Feed. Look at the first letter of truth, T. First letter of specificity, S. First letter of positive thinking, P. Those of you who cook, what's TSP with a period after it? Teaspoon. So this section is about how we nurture and feed the people who come to us for criticism with that very criticism that we give them on a daily basis. And I'm here to tell you it needs to be truthful, specific, and positive. And Henry's right. I am trying to role model all my behavior today. And I believe in order to be authentic, you have to be intentional. So if I don't role model my behavior, I'm a hypocrite. And what I see lots of speakers do is they put lists of things up on a slide to tell us what we're supposed to do, but I'm not seeing it with my own eyes. You can't tell me you're empathetic. You have to live it. You have to be it. And so what's, what I find with truthful, specific, positive feedback, I'm able to live my brand. And so my brand is you on your best day. You know, that, that's my brand. And so people, Henry, it's so funny. Like you, you, I don't know, you may have even seen this. I write on a flip chart, you and your best day. Even if there's a thousand people in the room, I just like doing that. And so every now and then someone will walk in and it's always a guy, it's never a woman, looks at the flip chart and goes, oh, you on your best day. Oh, you're having your best day, Michael? What happens when you don't have your best day? Am I having my best day? I'm not. And so I take a chill pill and you know, it's, look, I never have a bad day. I don't. Now, do I have bad things that happen to me? All the time. But I don't have a bad day ever. Because who's the only one that can make me have a bad day? Me. You can't make me have a bad day, Henry. Uh, you can't make me have a bad day, Steve. You can't make me have a day, bad day, Rick. Only I can make me have a bad day. And so I never have bad days because I do three things every day. I sing every single day of my life. I dance every single day of my life, and I give truthful, specific, positive feedback every day of my life. It is so hard to be in a bad mood when you do that. Now, Henry and all, I am exhausted at the end of the day. It is exhausting to do that. What a wonderful exhaustion. I sleep beautifully at night. It is a sweet exhaustion when you fill buckets all day. Because when you fill people's buckets, whose bucket gets filled the most? Yours. It's, it gets, it's in a way, it's selfish. I, I fill these buckets, see faces. Try telling a barista at Starbucks with great specificity what they did well. Try telling Jose, your waiter at the restaurant, with great specificity what they did well. Watch what this does to a human being. It, it's, it's, it's potentially life-changing. And boy, when you give that out all day, man, does it fill your bucket. I've been out to eat with you several times. So mastery is not you turn it on for the performance and then you save it. You're doing this all the time. And I don't do it as well as you. 
I'm trying to acknowledge the server, look them in the eye, use their name, and give them TSP. And when I've seen you do it, the seen and heard is so important. I'm going to be writing about that in Forbes. I'm hearing that from all quarters that one of the things that's been missing in the last two years is people do not feel seen and heard. And they're, they're starving for acknowledgement out there. Just starving. Also, it's, if you want to do this fun game, this is the Michael Alasso game. After a dinner you enjoyed, ask to see the manager. They come up like they're going to be executed. They kind of walk slowly and have their hands in that. What do you call that when they're in front of their, you know, genital clutch down here, like protect? Yes, can I help you? And when you say, you know, I want to tell you specifically what's went right tonight. You know that uh, uh, Julia was such a good waitress. She made sure onions were not in my dish because I'm allergic to onions. And um, this person was very conscientious about this and, oh, the chef did just an excellent job. Uh, sometimes um, salmon isn't as moist as it should be. Tonight, the salmon was perfect. And that didn't happen by accident. Somebody is the leader here and that's you. And I just wanted to thank you. You would think that person was given a $10,000 award. <laughs> just, well, you're just right, they sometimes well, well up. Yeah, they will up. And you see, like you saw Henry's enthusiasm about this. I get emotional about this. And I blame the political climate we've been in the last five or six years. I don't know about you guys, but I've seen a lot of unkindness to people in our wonderful country. And a lot of the recipients of that unkindness are in fact customer service people. Henry, I, I may have told you this story before. I was in an airport, I won't tell you which one, a woman my age, very kind of sophisticated, elegant, professional looking person was in the baggage service area, banging her fist repeatedly on the baggage service representative's desk, screaming the F word at the top of her lungs, berating this person who clearly was not the person who lost her luggage. And I would like to tell you that is an anomaly, but that would be a lie. It's almost to the point where I'm gonna refuse my upgrade into first class almost to the point, let's not get crazy here. Because invariably, the person next to me treats the flight attendant like they're an indentured servant. Now you tell me what book, holy or otherwise, says because we have the means to fly first class, because we have the means to eat in a nice restaurant, that we're superior to those people who choose to serve us. Show me the book, because it doesn't exist. You know, right before COVID, I got to go to India to present. I had never presented to India. So excited. And you know, when you fly to India, you fly business class. So your seat turns out into this bed. So the woman next to me was all out in her bed and she presses the button for the flight attendant. Flight attendant comes over and says, can you get me that magazine there? <laughs> flight attendant not only got her the magazine, she did several other very kind things. TSP, the woman didn't even say thank you. You know, I'm on the, I read this article, this really annoyed me, that said, we in America look up to people, we endow them with respect and leadership when they put other people down with snarky sarcasm. Isn't that horrifying? So I'm on an ambassadorship to prove that wrong. And I want all Henry's listeners to be ambassadors along with me. Which of the three letters is going to make us every bit as intelligent? is those people who put people down with snarky sar sarcasm, which is the hardest to do. Truth T, S specificity, or P positive thinking, which is the hardest. Now, for, tho for those of you who are saying truth or positivity, what I want you to do when I say go, say out loud the letters TSP, but leave out the S. Ready, go. TP. Yeah. Now, here's my point, everybody. It's not that I'm knocking TP. I have 11 roles. We're not hoarders. We have multiple bathrooms. It's just that I see people give TP pretty readily. You know, often when I'm introduced, the CEO will say, oh, team, you've done a, a wonderful job this year. You've worked very hard, and I wanted to honor you by bringing Michael. I, they're certainly being positive and they're being truthful. I see little league coaches say, ah, oh, you kids work so hard. You get dirty every day. I love you. Well, that's certainly positive and I think they're being truthful. 
No, I think it's the S. It's the S. So I could say to Allison, Allison, I love you. I think you're wonderful. Well, Allison could giggle at that. Uh, whereas if I say, Allison, I think you're wonderful. I love the title of your book because it's a double entendre and it's funny and it's serious. Work your assets off. I love that you you said my name and that you were looking forward to hear me speak. And what I love is that you went first. And it's so hard to go first when Henry throws the ball at people and you did it with class, you did it with elegance, you kept it short, you kept it sweet. For those reasons, I love you and I think you're wonderful. Well, now Allison can't challenge my T or P because I loaded it with S. This isn't about sweetness, everybody. It's about data accumulation. I call it gathering beauty. What I think great leaders do, great moms and dads, great life partners, is that we're beauty gatherers. We go out in the world, we gather beauty, and then we report the beauty that we see. And that's what I'd like you all to do. Michael, I, I want you to make your generous offer and Suzanne will put it in the chat. Please make it. So Suzanne is putting my 35 secret weapons to help you be you and your best day in the chat. Right, Henry, that's Suzanne, that's what we're doing, yes? Yes. And what I do is I, I, my website, has videos for all of these. So I want you to go to the website and then I want you to connect up with me. If one of the videos doesn't make sense, give me a, give me a ring, give me a shout. I have uh, Sarah Rusniak is my like superstar assistant. She lives in central Pennsylvania. I've met her twice in my lifetime. Um, and she's like a life changer for me. She's changed my life. She's so conscientious. And then during COVID when I was whining for the first five minutes, I said, come on, pivot. And I hired a former student of mine. I started my career as a high school drama teacher. Someone in one of my first eighth grade drama classes, I hired, she has grown up to be a big shot in San Francisco. And she is my all things digital person, Wendy Gilbert. And she has created my whole website and keeps it alive. Wendy and Sarah, like they both, they, I shouldn't tell you this, Henry, but sometimes they even answer in my voice when I get swamped. I mean, they're, they're just enormous helps to me and they will help any of you that need that help if you say you're part of Henry's entourage because of my profound respect and love and admiration for Henry. Thank you. I want, there's, I, our time is evaporating. There's a main message of yours that I wanted you to share. And it's when you speak to a group of C-level executives, business owners, and your message to them about you on your best day is you chose to be a big shot. Would you elaborate on that, please? Sure. You chose to be a big shot. Now suck it up. I'm not really interested in introvert. Oh, I'm an introvert. Introvert, an introvert. You chose to lead. You chose to write a book. You're an expert. People want to see you as an expert. It's that beautiful blend between confidence and humility. And you gotta be right at the 50 yard line. You cannot err. You have to, Tom Brady, let's go full circle is a good example. He has the swagger and the confidence and listen to an interview. He constantly gives focus to the team. In New England, he constantly gave focus to Bill Belichick. This is what the coach wanted. This is the coach's vision. It's that perfect blend of confidence and humility that you need to have. That's your job. You know, and it's, it all goes back to that word objective, Henry. You got to think about what your objective is. So my objective today was you walk away from the screen with a couple of ways to upgrade the way you communicate and lead. Secret weapon number 35 is what I call my super objective. So in theater, super objective is what we want on our tombstone. Mine is that people should be better off as a result of having spent time with you. So what I ask you experts, you writing experts, my C-suite executives, what if every single interaction you had, every single one now, you're firing somebody, you were telling Henry you didn't like the speaker he bought, you were dealing with a, an unethical retail situation, you were punishing your child. What if you said, I want this human being to be better as a result of having spent time with me today? Can you think of how much better all those interactions would be? And that's what I demand of C-suite executives. Bring it. Everything you do is a choice. Just like the actor on the stage, they're making choices. And the
the accumulation, the accumulation, excuse me, the accumulation of the choices presents the character. Michael, I was brought on to a film set once to help the production. And I met with the director, screenwriter and the lead actress. And I said, writer, when you shared the backstory with her, um, what did you share? He goes, oh, I didn't share any of the backstory with her. And the actress said, yeah, I wanted to figure all that out myself. I said, oh, interesting. I said, you know, when you gave her what her direct, you know, what her objective was, I didn't have your language. I said, you know, oh, well, I didn't want to give that to her. I, I wanted her to come to that organically. <laughs> and then I went to the money and the money said, what do you think? I said, I think you got problems. <laughs> one thing is it starts with act two. We don't get act one. And there's no reason I'm rooting for this people or this person. I don't even know what she wants. In fact, I don't think she knows what she wants. Bingo. Yeah. And um, I, I'm sorry I wasn't TSP with them, but it, you know, money was at stake. I was brought in because they, they wanted to know about a second round of investment here um, in this. So it's the same thing though with what you do with presentations and they're going after the Bixby account and they're making 35 different decisions when they're up there in front of uh, Mr. or Ms. Bixby uh, and company. Uh, that's an old reference to the Blondie cartoons, uh, pretty old reference, but Michael got it. Okay, so there is so much here uh, that's so rich. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for sharing your time. Um, I have a couple of commercials uh, to give. We have a, another expert uh, this week, Michael Haig, Hollywood storytelling expert, and he's coming in on the 21st, and it's a no-cost webinar. He's presenting the Hollywood secrets on storytelling, and there's Q&A, so you can ask him any question you want. It's interactive. So that's gonna be April 21st. If you, uh, maybe Suzanne, you could put something in the chat for people. Uh, if you can't find something on our website, please contact me and I'll, I'll hook you up with that. Um, the other thing is, um, if you know of somebody who wants to write a book. So in the spirit of Michael Olasso and what he taught me, I do no cost book chats. I will meet with people on a strategic call for 45 minutes. But then there are other people who have come into our life. Allison, Steve Brody came in and had their book and said, is there anything for us? And we invented a department and we have something now called the promo chat. If you're an author of a book, come in, we'll give you 45 minutes. It's not a selling zone we'll give you strategic advice on how you can get more eyeballs on your book. How can you, you use that book to leverage it to attract more high paying clients by marketing with a book and a speech? Um, you know, let's, let's do the uh, Zoom applause. Um, I think this is from the uh, ASL. Uh, so the Zoom applause for Michael. Thank you so much, um, Michael. Um, I hope we get to see our beloved Red Sox together again. And uh, I, will, I will take steps to make that happen. I'm going on a 16 city speaking tour and Boston is, is on the tour um, because I also believe people want to be connected live. And to your point, I'll work hard to make sure those people are seen and heard. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you again on the Marketing with a Book podcast.